Welcome to the Women Abroad Podcast. I'm your host, Lisette Esquivel. This show is part of the section Women Who Inspire, where you will learn stories and experiences of successful female expats from all over the world. They will share with us the secret that nobody is willing to tell you about living overseas. Welcome to another episode of Women Abroad. My name is Lise Esquivel, Global Editor on Wallow.com. I'm in charge of the section Women Who Inspire. And now we have another section, is Women Abroad. Today, we're going to travel very far from the general places that we go. Now we're going to Africa. And we, we have a special guest. Um, her name is Fanny Odushala. Uh, she's a um, research and NDP consultant. Uh, she's the managing partner of C2M Solutions, a business consulting firm that uses data to drive business decisions and bring product ideas to life. Fanmi is involved in operational general management and client services of businesses within the West African sub-region prior to establishing C2M Fanmi started her career as an analyst in the finance department of the Coca-Cola company. Very impressive. Uh, 15 years later, she's advising businesses using a combination of her skills in finance, marketing, research, strategy, and new product development. Today, she specializes in quanta, oh my gosh, quant, quantitative large-scale research projects and new product of development to help businesses achieve growth and objectives. So, Fanmi, welcome to Women Abroad. Thank you so much, Lizette. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Glad I could make it. Yeah, finally. Um, well, <laughs> let's get started. Well, you are from, from Nigeria, sure. but you have mm -hmm. lived in Ghana, Cuba, mm -hmm. Guatemala, and Spain, and now in Liberia, Africa. So, mm -hmm. why did you move? to the Republic of Liberia. Um, tell us a, a little bit about your background, why um, you have traveled so much. Okay, so like you, you mentioned in the intro, I started my career in finance um, in the, at the Coca-Cola company. And from that experience, I realized that um, the way my mind works, even when I'm doing something small, maybe just accounts receivable or, you know, I'm pushing the invoice or whatnot. I really want to understand how, what the activity that I'm doing impacts the entire company. How is it, how is it adding value? The moment I don't do my job, I want to understand what impact it's having on the company. So from there, I moved into other roles um, in other companies. So from marketing to, I've done HR, I've done pretty much operations, I've done different parts of the company because I really wanted to just understand how companies work. And in the process of doing this, uh, it took me from not just shifting companies to shifting departments, but also sometimes shifting countries. Uh, so yes, Ghana, I actually initially went there for my undergraduate studies and then stayed back uh, a while to work there. And from the contacts I made in Ghana, I uh, <laughs> I started traveling to other parts of the world, including uh, Guatemala. And uh, from there, I decided I wanted to go for my MBA. So I ended up in Spain at Instituto de Empresa or IE Business School. And uh, after doing that program, I realized that I really wanted to be back on the continent. I wasn't sure which country it was going to be, but I chose my home country, started from there. And once we sort of established in Nigeria, opportunities from other African markets came So again and i'm so happy to sort of be on ground and be operational so I, I guess that that may be the reason why i also travel a lot and not just delegate someone else to do it okay and so and now that you mentioned that you you studied in spain uh did you learn spanish or not yeah. <laughs> i'm curious yeah bless for you i well i haven't practiced in a while but yes uh so even before moving to spain guatemala is spanish speaking of course so Oh, yeah, I did yeah, have yeah. A, a, a private tutor there. <laughs> I would Lovely. say at this point, I'm probably having survival Spanish. I cannot be sold in Spanish. I can get around very well in Spanish and some French as well. So, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Fascinating. Great. Um, so, 
tell us uh, what stereotypes did you face for being Nigerian in Liberia? Maybe it's not so different because then uh, you are in the same continent. But anyways, it's important to to understand um, these stereotypes that you you faced. Yeah. So no, it's funny uh, because Africans. I mean, some of the Africans I've met here actually say, you know, if one thing they realize about Liberia, that Liberia is not African. Uh, and it, I think that's coming from a place of there are certain shared histories that African country, countries have. There are certain things we say from our childhood that they would say, oh, the same thing happened to me. Or like we were growing pepper in the back of our house. I even think that not necessarily even African, but other countries would have that they don't necessarily have here in Liberia because of the history, the war, you know, all that. So, um, and then there's that mentality of Americanism as well, like being American. And again, it comes from their history. So, yes um actually when i do go out and meet people so today i was even having a call someone someone um a librarian wanted to do something at, at, at the house that i lived in and i was on the phone with the person telling the person he says are you american so for some reason when you sound different they think you are more you are more like uh, americans know i don't sound american but for the librarian it's like if you don't sound like us you must be them americans um so I don't think I face any stereotype being Nigerian because most of the time people can't even pick that I am Nigerian. But I mean, once they, once they can pick that you're a foreigner, then of course they want to inflate prices or um, yeah, they also don't, they, like, they, don't, they don't keep to time. Like everything is tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. So they feel like they can always push your work and go do other things um, and come back to you. Um, I also find the stereotype, not necessarily because of nationality, but being a woman, especially that the women here are not necessarily strong. Uh, they are not opinionated or they are not strong characters. Like they are not highly skilled. They don't expect certain things. So again, I'm remodeling my home and when maybe the electrician is coming to work or a bricklayer is coming to work, I'm literally telling them how I want it, what they should change. And they're just looking at me like, you're a woman, like, no, you can't, you can't know. Like yesterday, one of the technicians actually said, I am the technician. Let me do my job. I was like, you're doing it wrong. Who puts an electrical wire into a drainage pipe? I have never heard of that before. You put an electrical wire into where water goes through. But again, it's like, I'm a woman. I can't, I can't possibly know any better. <laughs> oh my. So, <laughs> so according to what you're saying is in, in, in Liberia, uh, it seems like, um, uh, women are not used to raise their voice and they are very you know the men are the who rule the place and mm -hmm. so there is no uh, you know there is uh there is a gap there so in yeah case no there, gender. there is a very big gap the, the men are maybe technically technically skilled and the women actually in Liberia they're the debt of skills generally so even those that we are saying that they are like the technician they're terrible. They're not that great, to be honest. They're not of a certain standard, but because they have had more opportunities than the women, then they, they definitely feel that they are better. And it's just from statements that they make. Like, they feel like you, you, you can't possibly do it yourself. So like I said, they like to procrastinate. Um, I wanted someone to go into the attic to pass the wire. I don't want it to be messy. And he said, oh, I'll come tomorrow. And I said, if you, if you don't do it today, I will do it myself. And he said, they're going to go into the attic. And I'm like, <laughs> why not <laughs> is, is it ladder i can climb the ladder yes i can open the attic door and go into the attic like i don't understand why this is such a big deal <laughs> but oh yes like, they don't accept it but the funniest thing is that the lady that helps sort of like um she cleans the house and whatnot she herself is shocked that i can do this thing so she was actually telling someone that oh she would actually do it the other day she was changing the the door locks herself but the, but that's that's yes so there's that gap like the men are sort of tech, somewhat technically skilled and they feel like they're so much better than the women and the women clearly should not know anything <laughs> yeah oh, complicated now i think um can you speak louder uh because i maybe the, your microphone is a little you know um i can hear you but maybe when i um publish uh in spotify it can be complicated and um, so okay. it's interesting you know um and uh, talking about challenges, uh, what challenges did you encounter? You, you mentioned something, but I don't know if it's something else. What challenges did you encounter and how did you overcome them in Liberia? Uh, 
No, the challenges, I'm still overcoming them. I mean, one of it is like the debt of skills, like I said. You want to do the simplest thing for you to get um, someone that can do the job well and do it one time is very difficult. That's just the honest truth. Um, small mistakes can cost you a lot. Like, I mean, right now, I'm sort of in like a house mod remodeling phase. So those are the examples I, I can immediately give you. Um, because when it comes to work, if I want it done properly, I probably will not use someone here. I will call someone from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Benin. And, you know, now we are in a, in a remote world. Anyone could do those sort of jobs. Because I want to say, when it comes to work and tight deadlines, I don't have the patience um, at the moment to be training someone and making errors. But I mean, with the remodeling, I can't be flying people in to do the stuff. But um, for instance, one of the one of the workers had put on the pumping machine, the pump to pump water, and didn't realize that it wasn't pumping water, and they had left it on until it burnt. <laughs> Oh and then when I got back and I realized that, but this thing is not, it's not, pump, it's not pumped. It needs to be primed. Like it doesn't have water, right? I, I realized that they had burnt the, burnt the pump and then I had to spend another $200 replacing that pump. So now I'm just like, don't touch anything, right? <laughs> so it's like, those are just some of the challenges. It's, the, it's not their fault. It is this long period of civil war, long period of Ebola has also set them back. Uh, but it's, the best, the, the, the challenge is also an opportunity. I mean, that's why I'm here. It's virgin land. It's like, think about everything and everything from telecoms to banking, to technical skills, to think of anything is needed here, right? So although it's a challenge, like someone like me wants to probably move money or bank or whatnot. And it's like, every time you literally physically have to go to the bank, you can't do anything smoothly online. But it's also an opportunity to sort of create value. The moment you're able to solve that problem, then you're able to um, um, capture that opportunity. So, so, yeah. so for you, the reason that you are in this place with so many challenges is because you see it as an opportunity, as all these yeah. uh, situations that say, okay, there is not good services, or that people don't have the skills for, you know, like the electrician man or whatever. It's that you can bring these opportunities with your, with your knowledge, with your company, right? Yes, no, absolutely. So, I mean, it's one of the frustrating things, but it's one of the things that attracted me to the country today. All the things I'm missing, it's an opportunity to build the things and build it well, you know. Um, so, yes, it was one of the things that attracted me. One of the things I'm doing uh, later on in the month is also just training women to say, look, you don't have to be just the cleaners or, you know, the doing menial work. You can actually learn simple skills that... You can learn how to use a computer. You can learn how to answer a phone. You can learn simple skills that already put you up the ladder from what you're doing right now. And these things are very, very simple. So it's just a lack of the things. Imagine just doing a training. And, and that's another thing. Library is so expensive. You could do a training. And I'm telling you, the train, charging $50 per person for an hour is cheap. <laughs> it's cheap. And I'm literally just teaching you how to, how to be a better worker or how to how to how to use a computer for an hour and I'm charging you $50 per person. And I'm even, just, even if I'm just training 10 people, that's already $500. You, you understand? So because there's just so much of a lack, um, there is an opportunity to be captured at the same time. And yeah. And do you think that just this, this situation happens in, a, in, in Liberia or it's something in, in general in all the countries in Africa? Uh, I definitely will not generalize and say all the countries in Africa. And I've worked in a lot of countries in Africa. I haven't felt like this to say, oh my God. I'm telling you, literally, it's in everything. Just mention it. The opportunity is there because the locals don't have the requisite skills to implement those businesses. And then a lot of international companies, I hope your podcast doesn't send them all down. A lot of international companies also haven't started coming here. So uh, Liberia also, because of the history, it's more NGO run or donor run at the moment. So the private sector is more the Lebanese community and the Indian community. I mean, no one can criticize me for that. It's just the truth. All the supermarkets are almost Lebanese owned. Um, you know, think, yeah. So it, it, it creates such a huge opportunity for, for, for something new to be built. Yeah. I don't know if that. Okay. And um for example, um, you're an entrepreneur, no? You have a market research firm called C 
C2M uh, with, with offices in Nigeria, Benin, Republic, Ghana, and now starting in Liberia. Tell us more about your work in simple, you know, it, it sounds very complicated even when I, <laughs> when I was reading your, your bio, but tell us in simple words, um, what do you do exactly, you know, it's as, like uh, we were kids, <laughs> um, and, and all the services that your, your companies provides. Yes, so C2M um, is short for concept to market. So concept to market, you have an idea and you're trying to bring it to market and how do you do that? So people have ideas all the time and they don't know how to actually get it into market and to implement it or to get someone to pay value for it, you know, having a customer. So this is what we do for businesses. Um, you have an idea or you have a product. There's some company sitting in Europe and they're saying, how can I enter the African market, right? Which market should I enter to? So let me just tie that into your previous question. So this opportunity zone exists across the continent on the same level. Some countries are more difficult than the others. Some are easier than the others. Some, those opportunities have already been captured, right? So it takes someone to analyze these opportunities, where they are, what kind of opportunities. If you're going to come into Liberia, which sector should we be looking at? What should we do differently? So it's using data to drive this business decision where we can actually advise you and say, don't go into this market yet, depending on what your product is, or enter into this market and enter into it by changing your packaging or reducing your product size, right? So it's, 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 it gets a bit complicated, but the simple point is you have an idea and you want to get it to market to your customers. Um, and you want your customers to be able to pay value for it. So who helps you with that, especially when you're not familiar with the market? So this is related to data analytics, all the stuff that is on yes. vogue right now, uh, mm -hmm. that companies are requiring data, study, uh, all this uh, so analytics. Yeah, data, needs, data needs to be captured and the data needs to be analyzed. But uh, for us, the focus is not just saying, oh, we are, we are data analysts or that we analyze data. In the end, just, I mean, use yourself as an example. In the end, you don't want to say this data has been analyzed. You want to say, what is the decision that I should take? I came to you for a reason. These are all my problems. We use the data to, you know, drive where you should go or give you, give you sort of guidelines or action points. So that's sort of like the end goal where the clients, they eventually able to see a document of action points of what they should do. But yes, data and analytics is like part of the process and in the buzz right now. <laughs> And I think that's a very, well, it's a crucial job uh, position right now. And well, it's a, bit, a good opportunity, you know, you know for, for the new generation to study all of this, because it's um, yeah. a, a lot of um, people requiring all these services. So you're very smart. <laughs> you're in the right business. <laughs> and it's honestly, it's very simple. So I mean, part of the training I think I'm doing for those women. So I'll give you an example of a project we did in Benin Republic, and we, are, we may be replicated in Monrovia or in, in Liberia. Addressing system is very bad. Um, and this used to be the case of many West African countries. I mean, I remember living in Ghana, and you want to give someone a direction and say, go down that road and you see a mango tree and then you turn right and you see a woman selling rice and then you turn left the day that woman selling rice is not there it's like you're going to be lost because you keep on walking down that road and you'll not see this woman selling rice like we literally use things rather than saying go to number five of 10 street you know so Liberia doesn't have addressing system at the moment. So if I was to give you my house address, it would sound something like, oh, and then you see this building that is cream and whatever. Oh my so, God. Yeah, I mean, in, in, 20, in, 20, in 2021. So even uh, about three years ago, we did a similar project for Benin Republic where we mapped the city, um, where we could tell you using GPS coordinates where what, what is where where is a school, where is a church, where is a hospital, and this is mapping the city street by street. And th this helps government to plan. There are more people on this side, so we need more schools. There are more uh, uh, hairdressers on this side, so they need more electricity or whatnot. And how we did that project was literally to hire people on every street and put a phone in their hands and say, you know how to make calls, you know how to use WhatsApp, right? Then you can capture data. It's actually not that difficult. You just press this button, it captures GPS. You enter this person's name, enter this, right? So it's not necessarily bringing researchers with 10 years of experience. It's using people on ground. So part of the training that we're doing is literally training women on ground on how to capture data. Because when we are going to do this, um, 
cadastral or mapping project, uh, you want to use locals who are familiar with the terrain to, 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 to do the mapping. And they're going, they going to get it done faster and easier. And it's going to also have an economic impact of the community where you're hiring locals to actually do the work. But it's, it's actually not difficult. I know that there's this uh, mystery around data right now and everybody's trying to make it look like, oh, you need complicated tools to make it work, but it's actually very relatively simple. Uh, so yes. <laughs> so it's not complicated because yeah, it sounded very complicated. And well, um, that, uh, if I remember, the last country that you live before Liberia is uh, Spain. Uh, so I moved from Spain back to Nigeria, and then from there I moved to Benin Republic, and then. <laughs> so what is your last? I, I, what I ask because, for example, I I would like I would like to we talk about the the culture the work mm. a culture so that you can yeah. uh, talk about a little the differences between the culture of the last country that you lived and yes, yeah. our, um, in Liberia, for example, mm -hmm. what I ask. Yeah. How has the leadership or the schedule, the, the attitude of the people, all the stuff in order that people understand the differences because each country, yeah. you know, has uh, a different work culture. So, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I did move from Spain in 2012, but I haven't actually really stayed in any country long enough uh, since then. Like, I've just been literally moving across West Africa. I would still say Nigeria is based, but I've just been traveling all across West Africa. Um, and now I've sort of made Liberia uh, based. But to answer your question, in terms of, uh, <laughs> like I said, Liberia is very different. Even for Africans, we know that Liberia is, it's sort of unique in itself, uh, but also because of its history, it's more American than European. So again, it doesn't really compare to the, I mean, the European culture is also very different from the American culture, right? So um, Americans are very loud. I mean, I come from Nigeria and I, I'm telling you, you may have encountered Nigerians maybe at the airport or Nigerians are loud. Like we're speaking on the phone and you think we are, we are using a megaphone, we are loud. So for me, in Nigeria to tell you that librarians are loud, I'm telling you, like everything is done on a mega scale. It is noise. <laughs> Europeans are not like that. Um, they also even diversity of food, I find. Uh, rice has to be like the national dish. There's rice, the people are eating rice every day. Um, and even as a Nigerian, that is strange because they have a diversity of food. I mean, yes, you have greens, but not as much as you would expect. And again, Europe has like a diversity of dishes. In fact, that's literally what I live on. I, I know I'm living in Africa, but I could be Italian in another life. I, I, I eat different sorts of pastas in different ways, from spaghetti to lasagna. <laughs> so, to my All parents, delicious like, dishes. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you could have it in different varieties. You don't really have that variety here. Um, I mean, the people are different. The culture is different. They do love to party. So I would say maybe that's a similarity between Spain and, and Liberia. Like the weekend starts from Wednesday and yeah, it's like you, you and that's something that I really did like about Madrid. It's like, yeah, every day you, you work hard every day, but you live your life at the end of the day. You don't, you don't delay gratification. You, you must have that glass of wine. You must go out and have, have tapas or something, you know, like you don't, you don't wait and say, let, let me work for a month and then I would, yes, you still take the vacation, but every day you feel like you're actually having a, a, a piece of enjoyment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But so in Spain, the people um, party more than in, in Liberia? So according to what you're saying? Maybe, maybe, on, maybe on the same scale. I don't, I don't know if it's more, but Spaniards would come here and they would probably love the energy of how they party so much. I mean, from literally from Wednesday the weekend, like it's like a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's close to the end of the month for those maybe collecting their salaries or whatever, then in fact, workers, half of the workforce don't go to work the day they get paid, the next day after they get paid. Because they're, they're it's 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 like full blown parties. <laughs> Uh, yes. But talking, talking, uh, talking about culture, work culture, um, so the, the people in Nigeria and Liberia, uh, they don't, they don't have, uh, you know, um, technical skills, according to what you're saying, and obviously in Spain, it's totally different, does the system works better, 
Um, and what about the schedule uh, and the, and the um, salaries are very low? I, I could think that in Africa, the well, Liberia, the, the salaries are very low compared to Spain. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and then you also probably don't have the same government uh, support in terms of like your healthcare. Yes, it's there, but does it really work? You know, so you don't, you don't necessarily have that um where you, you have unemployment benefits and things like that no you don't you don't really have that here um so yes okay so yeah it's totally totally different in uh, europe <laughs> excuse me what are you say no, the library is definitely not europe i mean I, I i'm trying to think of even like the most rural places i've been to in europe and you still cannot compare it. Like, yeah, no, it's not, it's not, it's not the same. Like there are still many roads that need to be built in Liberia. There's still many places that electricity needs to get to. I'm in the center of the city and I'm like literally on the Serrano of Madrid. Like that's where I live. Like it's really posh area and the electricity is still not stable, right? You still need backup power. <laughs> um, so that's, that's where I say there's a lot of challenges, but again, it's also a lot of opportunities. Elect someone could come overhaul the electricity situation. Someone could come overhaul, um, uh, yeah, security, and the, the, the telecoms, for instance. Um, there's unlimited internet in Spain, and it's everywhere, like cafes, you could go and you could connect to the internet, hotels. There are hotels here that don't even offer Wi-Fi because it's expensive. Um, on my, on my phone, I get 25 gig for about $50. <laughs> That's almost $2 a gig. I, I can't understand why you still live in Liberia. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, living in, in, in maybe in Europe with all the benefits, uh, the quality of life. And according to what you're saying, it's Liberia, it's, uh, oh my gosh, it's like, uh, I Don't love solving problems. So if, a, if, a, if a place is perfect, then I go to where there's a problem because it allows me to fix that problem. Let me tell you, the first week I was here, the first two days actually, I spent almost $200 on data because of what I was used to, like my devices, my WhatsApp, my mess, my images automatically download, you know, and I, I don't limit my data. Like I'm not one of those people that put my data off. So the first two days, I spent almost $200 on data. After that, I, 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 I disabled automatic download of pictures. I don't need that. <laughs> can imagine, no. In, in Europe or even in America, you don't spend so much money in two days. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, no. It's so, oh my gosh. Yeah. They are People very, are taking advantage of the fact that those services do not exist. If I tell you what the banks are doing here, it's crazy. <laughs> If I use my local card, so I have a local bank card here, and I go use it at another bank's ATM, they charge $6. And I was telling a friend from Abidjan the other day, it was like, oh, it's normal, you know, Cote d'Ivoire does the same. For a country, pay more, because I could e easily use my Barclays card at Santander, and I'm definitely not paying six euro per transaction. This is per transaction, by the way, per withdrawal. You're charging me $6 per withdrawal. And then on your on your ATM, the maximum is like hundred and twenty dollars you can take out at once. Imagine you want to take out a thousand dollars. You're gonna no. be paying sixty dollars just to withdraw because you're using another bank's ATM. And there are just many other things. Like you want a reference letter from the bank, you know, that letter that says this is this person's account number. Um, they bank with us. Yes, we we agree they bank with us. That letter that sometimes I can even get for, for free in many banks that are banked in the world, they charge. $40 for that paper here. It's shocking. What the banks know 14? that you don't- 14? 4, 0, 40. Ah, four. 40, oh, no. 40, four. 40. Yes. Oh my God, it's extremely expensive. Oh no, 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 no. It's beyond the line. That, yeah, yeah, they know you don't have a choice. Like where are you going to go to? The next bank is doing exactly the thing. There are only two telecoms company in Liberia. <laughs> So, and they do, they have the same data package. You can't say I'm going to the competition. There's nowhere to go. Liberia has taught me to be humble. Now, when I go to the bank to withdraw my money, I'm very nice. It's not like in my, in Nigeria, I could, I could say, I want to take my money. I want to close my account. Not here. <laughs> here, 
here you go. It takes <laughs> good afternoon, ma'am. How are you today? Please. I want to take out money in my account. How much? How much can I take out? <laughs> You'll be very humble. <laughs> so it, I, I think it, it seems like uh, talking about Africa, Nigeria. It's a uh, better place uh, than Liberia in some services. All this, it's, uh, it's kind of different. So it's more complicated in Liberia. Everything is more complicated. Yeah, I mean, so the sad part is, as a Nigerian, when I'm in Nigeria. We are like, oh, South Africa is so much better, or we compare to Rwanda, or this in Kenya, or this in Utopia, even Ghana. Oh, this is better in Ghana. In fact, you know, Twitter just moved their office to Ghana, and everybody's like, oh, we see, they're coming to Ghana rather than Nigeria. So honestly, we don't think as Nigerians that we are getting standard, standard. We think we're getting substandard, and to a very large extent, we are getting substandard. But Liberia makes Nigeria look look good. It actually does. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe South Africa, it's, uh, you know, because uh, uh, for menos here in America, South Africa, it's uh, um, has a better reputation that, you know, it's a uh, uh, high infrastructure, good services, even when you look for some pictures, looks very good, very modern city, and mm -hmm. all the stuff, it's like, like uh, you know, any country in Europe and America, uh, and South Africa, but uh, yeah. I have seen that other places are not like South Africa. No, no, yeah. So South Africa is also different in Africa and, and, and Liberia in its own way is also very different in Africa. But honestly, if there's anything I've learned traveling to all those countries, poorer countries actually pay more for services um, that you would not be paying for in, in developed countries at all. Or even, yeah. yeah. So say then it's strange, but it happens. Um, and so in, in your experience, is a country where there is diversity and inclusion? Liberia is a place where the diversity and inclusion? So first, Liberia is a very small country. The entire population of the country is no more than 5 million. I come from a country that we, we are not even sure if we are 200 million or more. Uh, my state alone, just one out of 36 states is 20 million people, right? So that's already four times the size of the entire country. My local government is bigger than the entire country. So it's not a very big country, uh, but yes, it's very open to foreigners. It's very open to, especially people of African descent. It's open to Americans. It's open. It's it's actually like a very. I feel like you don't necessarily feel discriminated or yeah. No, it's very open. People are friendly, except we know when they want to cheat you and double the price or whatnot. But that's standard everywhere, honestly. Yeah. Um, so yes, it, it is. Yes, they, I think they do encourage diversity. Um, in terms of women inclusion, what is, I think, pushing women back is the fact that they've not had access to the same opportunities that the men have. So even when a donor, a, a donor organization is organizing an event, maybe let's train people to, to become technicians or let's train people to become attendants, um, health attendants or whatnot. It's likely that a man will qualify more because even just the requirements, oh, you need maybe basic education, you need uh, primary school or whatever, it's likely to be men who have access to this thing, or even the access to the information in itself. You know, while those women are out doing cleaning jobs or, or cooking by the roadside and selling it, these men are being called to workshops and whatever and being trained. So I think um, that's where the disparity is, where you, will not, you may not necessarily find a lot of women being included on many levels of, 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 the, of the economic scale. So there is a very big, uh, very big gender gap, you know, there, no, there is. women and men, and I'm, like uh, women is nothing in Liberia. Oh my God. Yeah. So, I mean, you would, you would actually feel it. It's not that I've actually even gone to do research, but you actually feel it because especially when you're a woman and you're in certain places or you're doing certain things or you sound a certain way, they're actually genuinely shocked. You know, like, it's not like they're not used to seeing like for the donor organizations, a lot of women do come with them, right? So the UN is here, whatnot. so they see those women, but they don't necessarily expect it, maybe first of African descent, or they, they don't expect it of their own people because it's not common. It's not commonplace. Um, a lot of people, um, even just me saying that I moved to Liberia or that I'm here by myself and I'm exploring all, all these opportunities and I'm registering a the company, they're wondering, you're doing all this by yourself, uh, you don't, you don't, you, you, you didn't come here for, like, they expect that there should be a man I must have come here for, oh, where, where is your husband, or 
you know, did you have a, do you have someone here? They just cannot wrap out around their head. But men are able to move to countries all the time and set up businesses. It, like I said, the Lebanese community is very big here. The Lebanese community is very big in Syria. And it's the men who just leave home and then they go explore other places. But when a woman does it, they're like, how, why? <laughs> No, it seems like it's worse than Latin America. Uh, we think sometimes that uh, we have a very big gap, but it seems like uh, in Africa, uh, compared to Africa, we are very in a very good place in Latin America. So, so the, the next question was the well-being, but it seems that it can be a well-being if there is no gender equity. You know, so. I think it seems like there is no well-being in in Liberia. It's the even I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask because it's obvious that it's not well being. Uh, Many so challenges if you compare it to like a standard that you know, but again, is that like that story, I don't know if you've heard of that common story of two salesmen who were sent to an island, this company sells shoes and they send out two salesmen. One comes back and says, there's no opportunity there. Nobody wears shoes, so we cannot sell shoes to them. The other one comes back and says, there's plenty of opportunity there. Nobody wears shoes, so we can sell shoes to everybody. So the thing of perspective, right? So all the things that they're like, honestly, Liberia is like a blank slate. Just imagine. Yeah, but compared to Nigeria, compared to yeah. where the countries that you have lived, because it's a reference. Yeah, uh, yeah. It seems like there is well, no well being. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but for me, it's like, oh, imagine all the things I would like to change in my country and now have the opportunity to sort of do it properly from the start. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not comparable. Oh, okay, and now let's talk about basics. Uh, to, uh, let, um, tell us a little bit about the dishes, traditional dishes that people should eat if uh, they go for a vacation to mm -hmm. Liberia or if they want to, to live uh, in, in this place. I, I try to avoid, uh, I'm, I don't know, for some reason, I'm able to avoid local dishes. I mean, except those that I love. I, I love tamales. And, but anyway, <laughs> there is, if you come to Liberia, you'll be, you'll be served potato greens. It's like the, the green of the potato. It's not the potato itself, like the leaves. <laughs> they cook that into like a, a, a sauce and most likely eaten with rice. So there will be a lot of rice. If you're one of those people that don't eat rice, 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 and rice. Is that? Yes, rice. Like white rice. <laughs> rice in different versions. You'll be eating a lot of rice. That's like the national food. There's also something called cassava. So the cassava leaves. We have cassava in Nigeria. I don't eat cassava leaves. I'm very familiar with the leaves, but I don't eat this. But yes, they have that here where they eat the leaves again with rice or, or some sort of other stash. Um, there's also uh, the, it's like, it's made from palm 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 nut there's a like a it's like a palm nut soup so they have that they have that here as well so, so those are some of like the common local dishes but then honestly if you go to the restaurants you find a lot of american food so there's a lot of burgers there's a lot of pizzas fries yeah very american very american yeah and some uh, any dessert uh, that is popular or candies or drinks no um drinks it would be like a punch maybe a punch uh but yes no a lot of things are also imported here a lot of things i don't know if anybody from heineken is going to see this but when we when we drink heineken here we throw the bottles into the dustbin no recycling whatsoever at least in nigeria i can understand that because we have the brewery the bottle is sent back to the brewery here it, go, it goes straight into the trash can you imagine the thousands or the millions of bottles that get thrown away? Um, oh my gosh. So, yeah, so it's, I, I've been thinking in my head, how can I collect those bottles and just put it in a container and send it back to the Heineken company? <laughs> no, maybe, I don't know, create something new with these bottles, you know? Yes, yes, yes. No, recycle I my or something. But when I, no, they don't recycle anything here. Not the aluminum cans, not the... Nothing? nothing. So garbage? Oh my gosh. Yes. Garbage, garbage. No, no, no. The only thing they, they reuse are the plastic bottles. So like the water bottles, uh, when it's done, they use it for like oil or um, like granite oil for storing granite oil and selling granite oil. But everything else they throw away. Um, so initially I was, I still do, but now I keep it. Like I start my bottles, I start my garbage and whatnot. Uh, cartons and paper, everything. And when I give it to the guys to throw away, they just put everything together. I'm like, I spent so much time starting 
there's no point because they don't need it. They don't see value in it, so they throw it away. So now I just store it <laughs> until, until I can find use for it. No. Uh, but what was your question? I think I digress. <laughs> I haven't found I, I haven't found something good right now with this country library. Okay, um, now uh, how do people spend their time? How do people spend their time? You know how they uh, have fun. You know, but like I said, from Wednesday it's like a party. People just sit outside their house. They play loud music. I have a recording of me sitting in my house, and the next house for me is like a hundred feet away. Hundred feet, like. There's a field, there's a football field between me and the next door neighbor, a very big field. And when I was doing the recording, I was sitting at, literally where I'm sitting at, like the dining table. And when I play that song, it sounds as if I'm playing it right here in my house. That is how loud they bring out like big woofer speakers, put it outside of their house. And then they play music and they drink and they eat and they party. Like, Yes, they don't need a special location. From Wednesday, loud music, partying. And of course, people go, to, they eat out, they go to the club, they go by the beach, but the beach is very underdeveloped waterfront, but they still enjoy it. So yeah, they're very basic people, honestly. They can have- But, but it seems like they enjoy uh, spending time in the, uh, inside the houses with music, friends, all the stuff. Yes, no, so not necessarily inside the house, but like outside in their compound. So every small house has space, you know, outside mm -hmm. of, the, of the compound. It's not, it's not a city, you know, where you have boundaries. So you can, you can just put your speaker. Simple, and, they enjoy the simple things. And yeah. talking about customs and traditions, could could mm -hmm. be religious or civic uh, customs and traditions in Liberia? So the Episcopal Church is very big here, again, from the American uh, background. Um, I've seen that the churches do a lot of burials more than actual service. I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> um, like every time I see like the people are dressed up to go to church, there's also a coffin. I don't know. Uh, but Sundays, I don't really see people dressed up like that going to church. Um, but yes, I know that the Epicus Episcopal Church here is also quite big. Um, so for custom, oh yes, and Liberia has a lot of holidays. So for instance, they celebrate. I, I hope I hope they don't listen to this and come find me and send me back to my country. No, but they have they celebrate the first the first president's birthday, the second president's birthday. There is a fasting and prayer day that a lot of people actually, I see a lot of people eating, like, so a lot of people also eat out, like even to the security guards and whatnot, people don't cook, which is another similarity to, to Spain, actually. They eat out a lot. People don't like to kill. <laughs> um, so they, 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 they eat out. So even the fasting and prayer, by the way, this is a public holiday, public holiday, almost like, the only way I can attribute it is like, on Sundays, like Germany, everything is shut down, totally shut down. If you did not buy it on Saturday, you will not get it on Sunday. Yeah. So, so the, the, the stores are not open. No place, no, no place to go on Sundays. So the public holiday, you can go to the beach, but yeah, I mean, take your own stuff. The public, the public holidays, the same thing. Everything is shut down, which is very strange for me because public holidays for us is like, uh, you can go to the mall. You can, you know, the stores yeah. are open. Yeah. No, this everything is shut down. I feel like the stores even get fined for opening. Everything is shut down. So it's the, the day when people can go out and spend some money in the mall or doing many things here yeah. in America. So, it's, uh -huh. Yeah, or sometimes, you know, you've been working the whole week and finally a holiday comes and you're like, ah, oh, that's shopping. I've always wanted to do time to do it. No, dead. <laughs> Closed. Ooh, boring, boring. So, so that, 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 that's one of the, so they have a lot of this public holidays, like, um, the fasting and prayer day, decoration day when they go to the burial grounds and they put flowers there. This is a public holiday. But for me, it's not like I don't have a problem with public holidays. I have a problem with the fact that every time there's a public holiday, everything is dead. People can't work. You can't go out to buy anything, which is great. You know, people just take it on another party day. And I'm just like, I think the month of February has the worst. It's like Valentine's, I don't know, for some reason, was like a holiday this, this year for them. And then you have all the president's birthday. And then you have decoration day and you have fasting and prayer day. It's almost like lined up. So it's like one public holiday after the other. You're like, oh God, please, no, <laughs> no more holidays. But yes, 
that that is one of the unique things about about here as well uh things shut down the holidays and it's it's a safe country for women you know for example you you live alone uh it's a, it's a safe place for you for yes for i mean I, I honestly i do have a security company like um i use a security company i mean i'm in africa and i'm not taking any <laughs> any chances but um I feel safe, like I can go out and, and do stuff on my own and not feel, and not necessarily even drive, like I can walk and, and do stuff. But also to be fair, the neighborhood I'm in is, like I said, it's, it's very, it's, it's very civilized and it's very posh. So, but I do read sometimes in the papers that um, there is domestic violence and there's rape, high rape cases and whatnot. So in the, in the, in the, in the country, um, but overall, I think, where i am we're sort of in a bubble but even then um there is high cases of people's phones being snatched so you could be on your phone and a, uh, so there are bikes here they use the bikes. you take it yeah it happens in many many places not only you're in but mexico so, you, you know <laughs> of course no 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 yeah sure sure so but in your case maybe it's for for the area where you live that it's uh very maybe a fancy area where you know, it's more that, that the police are always uh, around. The, U, the UN headquarters is one block away from me. So it's it's technically like a safe zone um, where I am. So yes, I cannot honestly give, but from, from what I see in the papers and even from some of the work that the NGOs are doing here, one of the NGOs that I met recently, what they're doing is finding ways to report rape cases in the communities because there is a prevalence of it and they want to be able to document every time it happens and find ways to action um, or prevent it, you know. So um, you find a lot of NGOs doing something around this, which means that there is, um, it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, and talking about accommodation, compare um, uh, a place in, in Spain, for example, in, in Spain, um, in a regular area, you know, not so fancy, not so low, it's a kind of middle mm -hmm. class. How much, um, how much money, um, um, uh, you, for example, if you don't want to say a, a specific amount, a range, uh, how much for um, uh, a middle, middle class uh, accommodation in Liberia? I mean, if you do come to Liberia, and especially if you're here for a short period of time and your project is not in, like a, in the county, then the area you're likely to be staying in is either Singapore or Mamba Point. Um, and a, honestly, I would say like as a, as a, as a base fare, uh, the price you're probably likely to be paying for a furnished two-bedroom that has electricity, everything, is $1,500 a month, so $1,500. So that's something, look, Liberia is expensive for, and why I say it's expensive is because of what you're going to get for that $1,500. It's basic. You know, it's, it's, it's very basic. It's like furniture, uh, a kitchenette or a kitchen. Uh, you know, it's, it's nothing fancy, nothing fancy. The fanciest hotel in the country. So the CAF president actually came in yesterday. <laughs> Uh, and, and the fanciest hotel in the country where he's staying is about, depending on the room, but I think the, the base is about $200 a night. You can go online and see the pictures of this room. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not five star. <laughs> and uh, the, by the way, at the rooftop of this hotel, the internet doesn't even work. <laughs> and for, two, for $200? Ooh, oh my gosh. No, in the USA, you can get a better place for that kind of, you know. <laughs> so, that, that, is, that is the honest shocker about Liberia. It is, you spend a lot of money, but you are getting very basic stuff. So honestly, sometimes I think in my head, let me just fly someone in, get the job done. I have a peace of mind. I know it's been done correctly because if I, first I'm going to spend a lot of money here to use their own people but they're still not going to do it correctly. Um, so that's, that's just one. Uh, the second shocker that I got so is the language, right? So Liberia has this very strong connection to America and a lot of people in their mind are, you know, they, they, they are Americans, you know, but they don't speak English. Like the, the lingua franca is this Creole, it's 
it's it's Liberian English. But when you listen to it, it's very difficult to understand. Um, especially if you don't have, I mean, Nigeria has pidgin English, so especially if you don't have a Creole-based language previously, it's very, very hard to pick out what it is that they're saying. So that, that would be like the two culture shocks you might get, because I mean, you go on Wikipedia or whatever, and it's telling you, oh, languages and whatnot, you think, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'll be good. You might just get to the airport or even the bank, and people, the person, the person is talking, and you cannot actually pick out whatever it is that they're saying. Yeah. So the official language is uh, a English. special type of English, but it's not the regular English. Uh, no, no, so the official language is English, but the, the popular language that people speak everywhere and is Liberian English. So a type of English, Liberian, it's Liberian English. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's also, it's difficult mm -hmm. to communicate with people. Uh, if you speak English, like American English, it's complicated to, to the people understand you and you understand them? So depending on if maybe if you are out, I'd say if you're in most places, you probably have to tone it down for them to understand you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you actually have to tone it down a lot for people to understand you. Um, just make it very basic. Otherwise, yeah, you are going to have a hard time communicating. Except and the weather, to... how is the weather? So the weather is very West African uh, weather. Uh, when it's summer in Europe, it is raining season. So that's like the best way. Whenever it's summer in Europe, it's raining season here. So it's raining through spring and, and, and summer. And then August, where it's autumn, we get something called the August break. So the rain stop. And then September, the rain starts again um, until December. So winter, at the start of winter, uh, it's the dry season where the dry wind from the Sahara blows across West Africa. So you have a dry season until about February. Um, so that's that's the typical weather. So it's the same here. So it's, it's, it rains a lot. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it does rain. West Africa gets a lot of rain. Um, and also here, I've noticed that their storms are very very violent like the the rains like yeah we have thunderstorms but this you're having like loud thunder thunder sounds and lightning you know it's like <laughs> you you really feel the impact but um yes yeah, so it rains it does rain a lot throughout the year it rains a lot yes so it's uh to have a trench coat it's important and an umbrella have a trench coat, yes and rain boots depending on where you are at you need your rain boots that's something i miss actually that i i, I want the european rain boots you know the fancy cute ones <laughs> oh yeah from the from the fancy brands <laughs> and so it seems uh, the next question is difficult because uh, i want to ask you what are the do and don'ts of living in liberia but it seems like a lot of don'ts <laughs> uh let, let's try to get the, the bright side of this place, please. Yeah. Um, you have told me many things that are not very pleasant to, to, to listen. No, no, no. So, no but I'm trying to focus on the very few positive things the, that we can yeah. find. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. No, they're positive side. Like, I, like, you of know, living I said, in Liberia. Uh -huh. Yes. Accommodation is expensive, but it's an opportunity for you to create affordable housing for instance this is how my mind thinks sorry but they are also very beautiful landscapes mm -hmm. liberia is a country of only five million people but they have a lot of land like i said they import a lot of stuff so agriculture you know there's opportunity in agriculture there's opportunities in exporting there's opportunities in anyway um they're, they're also very beautiful like uh, there's a blue lake um, you know, it's in another county. There is a place called Libasa. It's an eco lodge. It's nice. It has a it has a beach and a lake in the same enclave. So you could go on a kayak and paddle on the lake, or you could go into the beach and swim. You should actually Google it. It's very nice. Um, they're, 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 they're very people are chill. So I don't feel even pressured to dress up which honestly in spain i can't just wake up in the morning and my hair is standing and i decide to to get into the street i mean i get where i used to live in spain i get onto the street and the dior store is next to me <laughs> so it's, it's not something i can try but yeah i can i can do it like nobody cares you know so uh it's the fact that it's basic also just allows you to be yourself in a in a in a, in a very in a in some sort of degree 
Um, and I, this, the, there must be a reason why I'm here. So I might not be selling the place well, but I'm here for, I'm, I'm still here. Um, and I think it's because of all the different opportunities that I see. It is a blank canvas for you to build what it is, like the future that you'd like to see. So, yeah. Uh, for example, if uh, the um, white people go um, to Liberia, uh, people are, are nice. So um, do you think that can be some, you know, discrimination? For example, myself, that I'm, I'm, I'm white. Um, uh, you know, it's all so Yeah, no, like, like I said, the, the, the Liberia's budget at the moment is very heavily donor funded. I mean, they're moving away from that, but so it's not very rare to see foreigners on the street or in, you know, in their vehicles or whatnot. There are a lot of uh, Lebanese Indians here, but there are also a lot of um, Europeans and Americans. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I actually feel comfortable. So part of my family is actually some part of my family is actually European and I feel comfortable, you know, inviting them over to come spend. Oh, no time. problem. Yeah. Because it's important to know, you know, some people, uh, some black people, uh, feel, Oh, I'm discriminated, you know, for example, the United States, but they treat bad to the, to the white people. So it's not logical. If you are complaining because you feel discriminated, but you discriminate. So it's kind of, but well, in this case, it's okay. Mm, and, Tell us uh, about the tourist places that people should visit in Liberia. So one of the things that I do, which is weird, it doesn't sell Liberia a lot, but I mean, so there are a lot of beaches here, like I said, but they're not very developed. So one of the weekend trips that I do is to go to Sierra Leone, which is next door. And I tell people it's, it's a plus because you can literally do two, three countries on one trip. You can fly into Liberia and do Liberia, Sierra Leone, and you know, even Cote d'Ivoire or somewhere else that you want. You can do you know, the countries nearby. But um, Sierra Leone has a little bit more developed waterfront than uh, Liberia. It's also cheaper um, in terms of you, you have more of your spending power. Uh, so I do that. Um, but like I said, there's the Blue Lake, there is the Echo Lodge, there is then there are a lot of like restaurants and places to, I mean, I, I know that that's not like an attraction going in a country where it doesn't have much, that, that is an attraction. That, that fancy hotel that I talked about that is like the fanciest hotel in, in Monrovia. Now it's, it's like the place we go sit and watch sunset. You know, we go sit and watch the sunset. <laughs> so. there, there are, there are safari, safari uh, um, uh, places that the people can go as like a tourist. If you want safari, that's East Africa. West Africa does not have safari. I mean, yes, Ghana has uh, the, yeah, oh, no, sorry. Nigeria has the Ankari and Ghana has the Kakum. No, it's not Kakum. Oh, the one in Tamale. I've forgotten the name, but there's that um, place in the north. But it's not the same. If you want a proper, if you want a proper um, safari, safari experience, it's, it's East Africa. They, they have the, uh, the landscape, the animals for that. Honestly, if you find a lion in West are Africa. In East Africa. What countries are in East Africa? Sorry, East Africa, yes. Yeah. So Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, mm. Tanzania, those places. Ah, if Tanzania, you yeah. lion, If you find a lion or a giraffe in West Africa, it's li most likely imported. And this is why you, can also, you can't also generalize uh, Africa. <laughs> We go to East Africa to go see the, to, to go see the giraffes and the lions as well. <laughs> and it is common there that the women um, have um, arranged marriages, like in India and in other places. It's common or no? No, no, not, not, no, not here. Something someone has told me though is they said, if you were a man, I would tell you to be careful of the local ladies because uh, they try to get pregnant to foreigners so that they could have child support or you know. But I don't know how true this is. I'm a woman and I'm, <laughs> I don't, but they, they tell you to be very careful because you do see a lot of young women having babies. Um, and then you wonder where, where, where are the father of this kid? And so it's not uncommon to have, to see a young girl actually have multiple babies uh, for different men. So then you wonder what is, what is driving this? Um, but yeah. Okay. And any website, association, Facebook group, whatever that you recommend to those who listen to us and they are moving to Liberia? 
So, I mean, because I'm, I'm sort of professional, I'm not big on Facebook, but I check on LinkedIn and I reach out to people that are possibly in the country. Um, and that I do get responses. I also, um, uh, there's the internations community here. Um, so oh, I, yeah. you know, I, I did mention that next week, next week I'm actually hosting an event uh, where we're going to meet everybody. So there's also that. And I would also say get in touch with your embassy. Um, so you'll be surprised because it's such a small country. Like when I first got in, I literally just went to the embassy and they said, oh, get the number of this person who's the biggest, this, 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 this. And I called all the person and said, oh, yes, let's have a chat. And, you know, those are the people that sort of helped and guided me to say, oh, no, do it this way or do it that way. So, yes, yeah, just go to your embassy, touch base, especially, you know, if you are from one of those uh, groups that have a very strong presence here. Like I said, the Lebanese community has a very or strong presence. the Americans presence. also. Or the Americans, and yes. So in your case, uh, what is your immigration status? Are you a citizen, resident, or? <laughs> no, I'm not a citizen. <laughs> but you have permission um, to live legally. Again. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have to laugh because Liberia is one of those countries that when you get their citizenship, you have to rest in all the others. As much as we, we, we are not so maybe proud of Nigerian citizenship, it allows us to all dwell and multiple citizenships at once. So, you know, <laughs> we, are, we are keeping that. Um, no, so when I came in, actually, it was pretty very easy. It was very quick. I got my residence permit within three to five days. So I actually got the residence permit itself within three days. And then there's like a booklet, a residence booklet they give you that wasn't available at the time. And I think I got that on the fifth day. Uh, so it was pretty easy. And then where I stayed, the immigration service itself is just two blocks down. And you can literally just go in and say, this is what I want to do. And they ask you to submit the documentation. And that was it. For the work permit, what I did was to register the company. And again, the business registration process was very easy. Although I did have people who could have easily done the process, but I wanted to really understand the process. So I went to the business registration office myself, the Liberian business registry um, in town, and sat down again in this person's office and he explained the process. And again, within one week, uh, the registration. Oh, also, it's fast? It's fast? Yes, it's well, yes. it seems another good thing. Or whatever. Ah, I, I didn't think of that one. Yes, a a yes, fast process yes. for getting, for starting your, your business. Wow. wow. Yes. yes, the process and, is actually fast. And what, is, what, what do you miss most about uh, your country? <laughs> I think I mentioned a little bit earlier. I think the diversity of food, like, yeah, um, I do miss that. Soups, especially, like different types of, of sauces and soups. Um, I, I would say I miss something called computer village. I mean, so I, 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 I'm from Lagos and I live in Lagos and there's this place called computer village where you could get anything, gadgets, phones, computer, electronics, you know, you know, when you go to this one place, whatever you're looking for, don't go, whatever, it will be solved there. And I miss not having that here. Here I have to go into four or five stores and eventually you find out that it probably doesn't even exist in the country. Um, even for the simplest stuff, like I have someone coming in and I'm like, please bring me a doorbell. <laughs> and the person's like, really? There's no door? <laughs> Ooh. And, well, you, you and, will say, another opportunity. You will say, another business opportunity. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's in everything. <laughs> and um, yes, this doorbell is not even the fancy one. I'm not looking for the ones with the camera and everything. But that should also, you know, that's, again, that's an opportunity. So it's, Honestly, there's opportunities all around, and you just have to say this is the one I'm going to focus on. They need all, so they have a lot of opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question, um, how did you manage to be competitive in the Liberian market? What are the keys of your success? So again, it's a small country, and the, like I said, the population is not very, it's, they are coming out of a long civil war and Ebola and whatever. So the population is not very skilled, although you do have um, librarians coming back home and, and, and whatnot, but this, this huge gap. Um, so it's not easy, it's not hard to plug in. If you've successfully done business elsewhere and you have a winning formula and you know how to create value, you can easily succeed in Liberia. I, I joke with my team in Nigeria and I say, I, I really honestly feel like I only use 30% of my capacity here. You know, there's so much to do, but sometimes people make me feel like, oh, I'm rushing too much or I'm trying to do too much at once. And I'm like, I'm actually only at 
I don't think I've reached even 30% of the amount of workload or energy that I use in, in Nigeria, or even in some of the other markets. So it's, if you have a very good skill, like they're saying, a technician, you're a technician that is very good, an engineer that really knows their stuff and knows how to calculate stuff, you would stand out here very easily. Um, and everybody would want to would want to use you. So that would be um, honestly the most practical advice. And then of course going out and meeting people, taking advantage of the of the different meetups and events, because then it's those people that would sell you and and, and make the connect on your behalf to say, oh, there's this opportunity here and that there's that opportunity here. It's a small place. It's like living in a in a small village depending on the part of the world they're in. But yes, I think the Indians can agree that it's like Nigeria is like a small village compared to their population or compared to Nigeria's population. So yes. Okay, um, we're, we're done. So fund me. Uh, thank you very much for being in Women Abroad. Thank you for your time you and for so sharing with much. us. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Gracias por escucharnos. Visita nuestra página www.wellum.com, sección Women Who Spire, y no te pierdas nuestro próximo episodio.